Happy Thursday afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Ultra Live show with a very special guest. Actually, two special guests. Uh, before we get there, Maeve Brooks on her last voyage stateside of the Ultra Live oh, show. No. How you feeling? You feeling a little misty? Um, I th I'll be misty in a few days, I think. I'm yeah. kind of still in the midst of like packing, figuring out my yeah my capsule wardrobe. That's my mission to like pack light. Do you not know what a capsule wardrobe is? Andy? I I is it where you take the vacuum sealer and then <laughs> seal everything up? <laughs> well, I mean, you could do that, but a capsule wardrobe is like packing very minimally, huh. like minimalist packing and stuff that is very versatile. So you can have like maybe 11 things in your suitcase, but make like 30 outfits out of it. So that's like what I've been trying to do. A lot of Pinterest searches. <laughs> a lot of like, I'm going to wear seven coats on the airplane just to make sure I can bring everything with me. I love that. Exactly. Yeah. And all the way from uh, the Northeast, Miss Stephanie Leith, how are you today? CEO of Ultra Live joining us on the show today. How's everything been going today? I am good. I am not not preparing a capsule wardrobe. Haven't Fair enough. Haven't had to do that in a while. Yeah, that's <laughs> welcome to the pandemic, right? All right, so typically, Stephanie, we're going to kind of put you on the spot here. What Maeve and I do for our little pre-show warm-up is we bring some sort of recommendation to the Ultra Live fam. Sometimes it's mm -hmm. food, sometimes it's movies, sometimes it's TV, sometimes it's books, something that it, we can consume, basically. So, Stephanie, I ask you today, what recommendation do you have for the Ultra Live fam? Great question. You gave me a little bit of time to think about this. I did. And I, I have to share with the world the best movie that <laughs> I've seen in a very long time. Maybe some of you out there have already seen it. Top Gun. Andy and Maeve have not, despite my <laughs> urging. Know. So don't spoil it for them in the comments. But uh, everything, everywhere, all at once in theaters right now also apparently streaming already what really you know, yeah you know so many movies now don't they release in both places at the same yeah. time because there's just not enough people that go to the theaters for premieres huh oh. okay so why what what hooked you about this movie while well, i stall for time and look where it's streaming and then put it into my bookmark so i can watch it later oh, please do yeah um just a you know it's Every once in a while, you you watch a movie that's been so well written that you just want to watch it over and over mm -hmm. because there's so many nuggets to pick up throughout the movie. And and you totally, it's not so confusing that you don't understand and appreciate by the end. But there's enough intricacy that it that you want to go back and rewatch it. It's one mm -hmm. of those types of movies. It's a deeply philosophical movie, but it it balances humor, action, and you know just sweet moments all together in a beautiful way. Um, I think overall, if you are, you know, if, if you're somebody who tends towards nihilism, this is a great movie <laughs> for you. <laughs> okay. I, the first thing I saw about this was that it was a multiverse movie. It's, yeah, does does yeah. this have any sort of, oh, I missed the whole countdown thing. Does this have any sort of like Marvel tie-in or is this like you a know, different sort of multiverse? I thought it was related to the Marvel world, but it really isn't. It, it could, you know, it, it is the quality and caliber of a Marvel movie. But it is um, it is not weaved into that world. Hmm. Well, I do like Michelle yeah. Yeoh. I feel like I've seen her two or three times on other stuff. So yeah, yeah. I remember every her... actor in this could get an Oscar for their performance. Oh my gosh! So... I remember her in like Crazy Rich Asians. Yeah. She was good in that. That was really good. Yeah. When I saw the trailer, I was like, this seems like it would just like bend your mind. Like you have to do mental gymnastics to understand what's going on. Is it is yeah, it uh if you like movies like Inception yes. or things like that, it it's not as um it's more heartwarming and comedic than that mm. movie, but it's the same level of uh trippiness. Okay. Matrix it's in this category of Matrix, Inception, those types of movies. Yeah, those movies I wouldn't call like Inception, there was not a lot of heartwarming anything <laughs> in that. I love that movie, but I, no, there was a lot of death and despair. I, you, yeah. Nihilism, I think, was the thing you said. Yes, yes, yep. absolutely. Yeah. This cool. is like a redemption on nihilism. Huh. Okay. Oh, so I like, I like that. that. I very much like yeah. that. All right. Um. So Stephanie, I we don't randomly have you on the show. We usually have you on the show for big topics, uh, big things that are going on, holidays. And today we actually have a a, a big guest on, I, I, I guess I should say. Would you do us the honor of introducing our, uh, the guest for the show today? 
Absolutely. Well, I'm super excited for you guys to hear today from Elliot Wood. He is the director of consulting for Enable Ministry. Some of you might know of Enable. Um, I got to meet Elliot a few months ago. Um, we, you know, post pandemic, we get to go into conferences in person now. So Elliot and I have gotten to know each other at some of these events. Um, but for those that don't know, Enable Ministries is a managed technology service provider. Uh, in short, they are helping churches not only choose, but implement and manage technology and software so people and the organizations they work with can better serve and care for those mm -hmm. that are in their stewardship. Um, so if you imagine what a service provider does, you know, people like Enable, they help you not just think through and get the most out of everything you might use um, technology wise, but this can include everything from your online giving platform to the office phone systems you use, cybersecurity, and even, you know, if, you know, lock, electronic locks on your doors. They really covered the full range. Um, Elliot's been at this a long time, so he's really no stranger to what he's talking about. He's a seasoned IT strategist and consultant, and he's had over 20 years of experience helping churches not just effectively choose technology and implement it, mm -hmm. but understand the problems uh, that they're trying to solve with the technology that they choose to use. So, we love Elliot because he is a problem solver and it's why you should love him too. Um, so we're excited to talk about today the number one question that churches ask him and that we get asked a lot too, that maybe your church is thinking through as well, which is how do I know when it's time to change technology platforms? Hmm. So excited to hear from Elliot today and all that he has to share with us. Absolutely. Without further ado, uh, let's bring him on the show. And Elliot, I guess, uh, first off, welcome to the show. Uh, I guess the first question I want to ask you is, what if my phone system stinks at my church? What should I do? <laughs> wow. Yeah. So, well, this first thing, thanks for that glowing introduction. I, you know, I feel like a rock star now. <laughs> um, phone system, you know, we, uh, we, part of what we do is as a, 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 a a managed service provider as a consulting firm is we, we manage a lot of the day-to-day -day technology, just, you know, the, the nuts and bolts of things. But part of that certainly is helping churches choose uh, phone systems. And, and we're, we're really seeing a lot of benefit in cloud hosted systems, things like Microsoft teams as a phone system or, or uh, SwitchFox as a phone system where people can take a call wherever they are uh, on their phone, uh, on their smartphone, you know, their iPhone or at their desk or on their PC. Um, one phone number to rule them all. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and then that ability quickly, I'm in a phone call, but I can add somebody to it. I can add video, I can share chat, you know, all of those things you, you love about, you know, just the, the full zoom experience can be found right in a regular phone system these days. So. That's awesome. Uh, so before we kick into the interview, I was kind of reading through bio, kind of looking at Enable. You guys have a couple of different websites and a couple of different tracks. And I come from the corporate world. I was a IT IS guy. You know, this is a couple, you know, 10, 15 years ago, uh, and then became a pastor. And the one thing that I, I, the company I was working for was a rather large company. We were based in really Newcastle, the um, United Kingdom, but also Germany, but we had offices all over the United States. And the one thing I missed when I was going to a church was that there was never enough tech. I was doing a lot of IT and I was basically just bent over in server closets, like trying to get phone systems and VoIP things to work. And it it always felt like the, there was a lack of corporate technology in churches. Is that something you guys are trying to bring to the ministry field? Yeah, I, I think that's a good a good uh, description. I mean, when I started with Enable 18 years ago, uh, you know, we were we were still trying to get churches to invest in technology uh, at that time, and uh, you know, a lot of a lot of the churches we worked with, you know, they had some donated. Com computers and uh, some volunteers that were coming and helping after hours. And um, uh, we were we were involved with, you know, that response of, hey, this isn't working anymore. We're having to wait until our volunteer who works for, you know, some big corporate company can can come help sometime after hours next week. And um, our service, you know, put somebody uh, at their with their access, you know, throughout the, the week and um, and then started looking down the roadmap and going, how do we plan hmm. for technology as we go? How do we how do we think about what we need budget wise uh, over the next year, but not over just the next year, but over the next five years, because these things have three to five year, maybe sometimes eight year lifespan. So if you're if you're buying a ten thousand dollar server. 
that should last you about six years, but it's going to cost you another ten thousand dollars in six years. Mm -hmm. So you want to be prepared for it. And how do we how do we plan for that? So a lot of what we're working with our clients on is the the overall roadmap of uh, technology from how many workstations do we have? What what platform Google or Office 365 or um, other components are we are we bringing into that environment so that we're all working together and you know we don't have some people over here saving stuff in Dropbox and some people over here saving stuff. <laughs> oh, in their you're speaking my language Google right Drive now. <laughs> and, you know, nobody knows where the files are and um, and and if the student ministries guy leaves. Oh. So did all the files, you know. And then Im important <laughs> so, Sunday morning files are hanging in a Google Drive that you can't access because the internet's down. Yep. Oh, exactly. I, I'm well aware of all of that. <laughs> yeah. So a lot of just that that overall planning and how does it all come together, all work together, uh, so that the the you know the ministry staff and their ministry processes kind of align with the technology that they're using. Absolutely. Yeah, that's it's it's incredibly important, and and for those that you know that have been following Alter for a while, uh, maybe even Enable Ministries, you know that one of the challenging things is most pastors do not have a tech background. And so when it comes to these things, it, it often feels a little bit like a black hole. Of where do I even start? I know something's not working, but do, is it that I need a new technology platform? Is it that I don't know how to actually use the one I have? Or am I focused on the wrong thing altogether? Um, so. Elliot, this is something that you help churches think through. So what we would like to pick your brain about today is that process and flow. How do you how do you answer that big question, which is everything's broken, it's not working, where do I start? How do I how do I begin? What's the first thing that you you help churches think through? Yeah, so I mean the first thing is really trying to get a good lay of the land. What what's really going on here? And you mentioned a couple of a couple of things um, in the question, how uh, how are things not working? Uh, is it that it's the wrong, the wrong selection of tools? Uh, do we have the wrong products that we're using, uh, or do we not know how to use them? We didn't get the right training. Um, do we not have the the right implementation? We just haven't put it together right. Um, you know, a lot of times when you, you roll the clock back 10 years and, and, and a church may have implemented their church management software 10 years ago, at that time, that product had a certain set of features and functions, mm -hmm. uh, which, of course, were what was implemented at the time. And at that time, a church had a certain set of programs and strategies mm -hmm. that they were doing. And maybe they've changed pastors or uh, or just re in, revisited things, you know, maybe 10 years ago, they were a very Sunday school oriented church, you know, Sunday school, Sunday evening worship, Wednesday night dinner, and now it's all home fellowship groups. Mm -hmm. um, now it's a mix of online, uh, hopefully using Alter Live and, mm -hmm. um, you know, home fellowship groups and in person and different ways that you interact. Well, that, that means that to get the data in, to, to use it, to, to segment it, to figure out how we're discipling people and who we're discipling mm -hmm. um, is going to be an entirely different process. So mm -hmm. uh, so you've got those two things. The product was one thing and the, the programming and the, the church process was one thing 10 years ago, and it's a different thing today. So we, we may need to be looking at how is it implemented. It may very well be that whatever you're on, whatever tools you're using still still could support you, but just need to be reconfigured that way. Um, and then process. Uh, just, you know, one of the things I, I find a lot is churches uh, in any organization picking a tool for something. They have this kind of idea that I'm going to go pick a tool, and that tool's going to solve my problems. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, you've got to roll back a little bit and go, well, wait a minute, what is the process? And so we, we like to really start with, okay, great. Uh, if we have a, you know, a new guest follow-up process, what, what would that look like if we just had index cards and people and, you know, mailboxes in the break room? What would be the steps from a ministry process? Okay, they give us their information. We want to call them on Monday and invite them back uh, or send them a postcard or, you know, give them a Chick-fil-A gift kit card because that's what that's what churches like to do. Um, <laughs> and uh, and everybody likes a Chick-fil-A card. So uh, but whatever that step is, then then we're going to we're going we're gonna to draw that out and then figure out where does where does the software need to do a thing and what is mm -hmm. the thing that we want the software to do? 
Mm, that is, it, it's so important and it's often one of the most overlooked. We, we are often attracted to the new shiniest thing without thinking first about the why behind it. Mm. Why, mm -hmm. why do we need this piece of software? What do we hope to do with it? Because the right tool or the wrong tool without the right priorities is, is never going to get you there. Like you said. Yeah. Um, so part of that, so you just laid out two things. One is the assessment piece of what it takes. What's the actual problem that we're trying to solve here? Um, the next step is once you understand that, it's how how do you go about actually searching for that software? So talk us through that piece. So it, let's say you've, you know, you've walked a church through some of these questions around what they're trying to achieve. How do you go about actually choosing a platform with them? Yeah, so I'll, I'll back up into the assessment a little bit to say mm -hmm. the, the way the way we approach an assessment is usually across a couple of three days, um, meetings mm -hmm. with different groups of people on that staff, sometimes volunteers and, you mm -hmm. know, key key leaders and stuff that are that are also stakeholders in the process. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I like to to break those meetings or, or those listening sessions into um, into what I would describe as functional areas. So there's two ways we could do it. We can do it by department. We're going to meet with children's ministry. We're going to meet with student ministry. We're going to meet with adult discipleship. Uh, we're mm -hmm. going to meet with the worship team. You know, what do you need? Mm -hmm. The other way, and I really like this a lot better because it, it crosses those departments, but is by functional area. So let's talk with everybody that's involved with discipleship processes, mm -hmm. uh, which is going to be children's ministry, student ministry, mm -hmm. uh, uh, adult ministries uh, mm -hmm. across the board and what what is your discipleship pathway right so mm -hmm. if somebody comes to church at your church as a brand new you know out of the womb baby <laughs> and dies at your church in 100 years what does it look like to become a disciple of Jesus in mm -hmm. your church mm -hmm. and what happens at each of those steps right so um, but we'll simplify it they show up as a 25 year old and uh, first first time on Sunday, what happens? Well, they drive on the lot and maybe we've got the parking lot team out there and they're directing people that are new guests to our first time guest parking lot. And then, you know, running out to the car and greeting them and, you know, inviting them in, making sure they know where to go to get their kids checked in or know how to find a Sunday school class that sounds interesting to them, uh, whatever those things are. Or maybe they joined in via, you know, via a. Uh, online and they're jumping into that online uh, virtual lobby and somebody's mm -hmm. greeting them via text. Uh, mm -hmm. At some point, somebody's getting their information, right? So at mm -hmm. some point we know who they are. Mm -hmm. um, then what? what's going to happen? Well, we're going to invite them to a welcome class. So you want to learn more about our church. Maybe it's a luncheon, maybe it's an online thing. Um, maybe it's both, right? But um, here's here's more about First Baptist of wherever and uh, what it means to be a member here. Uh, what does mm -hmm. it mean to be a Christian? Um, mm -hmm. And then, and then you know, as they progress through, uh, you know, join the church. Maybe membership mm -hmm. is, uh, has got some definition or some uh, class you take or commitment you make. Um, then we're trying to plug you into a small group or other ways that you're connecting. Uh, so what are those, those points, you know? And, and at some point you're, you're joining in worship, you're connecting in, in a group, mm -hmm. you're serving some way or another, you're looking at missions as a, a way of life. Uh, mm -hmm. And so how, how do we, uh, how do we want to track those things? Um, mm -hmm. And so it's really amazing when you get the whole staff or a cross section of the staff mm -hmm. in, because you start to find out, well, oh, student ministries has been tracking this in a spreadsheet. The kids mm -hmm. ministry has been using church church management because we don't lose kids so we have to mm -hmm. check them in with the church management <laughs> software it's, it's very important not to give the kid back to the wrong parent and <laughs> most states you know in most states um then you know then you've got student ministries you know the kids are doing their very best to never check in because they're <laughs> facing that way so you've got to figure out how to take attendance without them knowing you're taking attendance um <laughs> but but you also don't want them to check in from somewhere other than church because then you're their alibi and you don't want to do that either. So, yeah, yeah, you know, uh, they're at the mall. They're not at church. Right. So um, but so somewhere around the first day at around 11 o'clock in the morning, somebody on that staff looks around the table and says, oh, my goodness, we've never talked about process together. 
as mm -hmm. a group. And that's where the real magic in the assessment is, is all mm -hmm. of a sudden we're sort of priming the pump of the way people think about talking about ministry process between the environments. Mm -hmm. a, a lot of times, you know, the, the staff have been operating in their silos. Children's ministry sure. is doing their things. This is how we check people in. This is how we follow up. This is the gift we give for your first time guest. Student ministries is doing a different thing. Adult ministries is doing a different thing. You know, mm -hmm. uh, come Monday, that, that new guest gets 32 emails from every department. They're like, oh my gosh, you just, <laughs> you just filled my inbox. So how do we coordinate yeah. that? Um, so, but that's just one flow, right? So that, right. that discipleship and assimilation process. Then we, you know, talk about volunteer management. You know, how do mm -hmm. we identify and recruit volunteers? How do mm -hmm. we look for potential victims? You know, and <laughs> then, and then it how took me do we... a little bit there I, to click. Huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> how do we get that to, you know, get them to apply? You know, yeah, particularly yeah. in some of the more secure environments. Yeah. How do we sign them up and make sure that we get their information? And maybe if it's children's ministry, we've got to do some background checks or some referrals or mm -hmm. things like that. But how do we make sure we did that? And then, okay, great. They've been background checked. We can put them in with kids. Uh, we got to train them. We got to show them, you know, how, how do we do Sunday school in this class? What is the curriculum? Let's make sure they're not like telling them bad theology. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, then how do we schedule them? How do we assign them to a role? Make sure they show up. Make sure that if they can't be there, they can coordinate with somebody else to get a sub. Uh, you know, all of those little logistical things. And, you know, a lot of times you find, well, you know, we're doing this with a spreadsheet because our software doesn't do it. Uh, or we're one department's doing it with a spreadsheet and another department's doing it with planning center and another department's doing it with the church management. And uh, we need to decide as a group that we're going to be on the same bus together. Mm -hmm. um, so that that process discovery is mm -hmm. how are we doing it and then trying to drill down to the, the requirements of what does the right. software need to do at each of those points to support the work of the, the ministry. Um, and in, in some, some cases, we may say the software doesn't need to do anything. This is a purely manual yeah. process. You know, yeah. we don't want to automate the relationship out of discipleship. Mm -hmm. That's not mm -hmm. the goal. Uh, but what we might want to do is make sure that if if it's Andy's job to meet with a, a small group coach and uh, touch base with them once a quarter, that the software automatically reminds Andy, hey, go meet with Stephanie's small group, mm -hmm. check in with them, see what's going mm -hmm. on. So he doesn't forget. Right. 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 Uh, so we're not automating the relationship out. We're not sending a, an automatic email to Stephanie to go as your group met. You know, mm -hmm. we're yeah. sending an email to Andy to say, go check with Stephanie and see how things yeah. are going in her group. So. Um, so we're coming up with that list of requirements, which then is the foundation for uh, our request for proposals to our candidate mm -hmm. uh, software packages. So part mm -hmm. of what my role is, is, OK, great, there's. I think I looked at Captera this morning. There's 200 and something different software packages in Captera that are listed as church management. Now, a lot of those are sort of related. Some are accounting packages. Some are giving packages. They're not all truly like what we would call church management software. But, mm -hmm. okay, great. There's 75 something that are actual church management proper software. Uh, well, how do we pick four or five to go look at? I mean, we're not going to go look at 75 of them. That's time consuming and right. cost prohibitive. Uh, so part of part of our role when we're helping a church is certainly going through that list of requirements and going, OK, based on what you told me, based mm -hmm. on the technical you know, aptitude of your staff and the okay. level of complexity that you're looking for, these are the these are the four or five candidates you should consider. And then how do mm -hmm. we get to three or four that are going to give an actual presentation mm. and then how are we going to talk about each of those in terms of what you said you need so mm -hmm. part of the the goal of that assessment being the start mm. and then building the requirements based on your assessment is instead of mm -hmm. the software company coming in and going hey here's what we're good at so what you need mm -hmm. is this and this and right. this and this right. oh and by the way we meet that exactly you know um you know every hammer's looking for a nail so yes. they're going to they're going to describe your needs as whatever they're good at. Right. Uh, if you are coming at it with your requirements, 
then asking them to, to, to tell you how they meet your needs, uh, then you're able to then start to, um, to evaluate them based on what you said is important to you. Right. Uh, now I find about 150 things on that list. <laughs> now, so now about that it, list. it seems that this is the difference between sales and consulting. Um, because as you're talking, I'm sitting here thinking, man, there are a number of churches that even I have come into contact with and have helped and have consulted with over the years that uh, the second I come to them, they have a list of problems. But if I was to put myself into the shoes of a salesman, I'm going to get immediate pushback from elders, financial boards, yada, 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 saying like, well, you know, we don't need that. I can do this, this, this. What what do you do? What is the conversation that you have to have if you're going into a church and you're getting pushback on, uh, you know, software is not an idol or whatever biblical constraint we want to wrap around it. How, how do you how do you go about that? So uh, first is I'm not a salesperson and we don't sell for the, the good answer the, these candidates. So so part of the difference is as a consultant, my job is to help a, help my client find uh, what they're what they're looking for. It's, it's a lot like a real estate agent. My, I work for you, <laughs> but um, and and um, so you know I I don't know that I've encountered that pushback because the the churches that have come to us have 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 largely come to us looking. I mean they've they've found us because they're trying to figure out how do we make this decision. We're not happy, but we don't know what's in the market or how to evaluate it. Hmm. Um, and but we know we know we're all over the place and that's a, a problem for us. So, um, you know, and I, I think, um, man, I, I'd love to see more churches where, say, the elders or the deacons are are actually looking at it going, hey, how could this be a tool for us? A lot of times that's sort of just out of their you know, out of their radar space of, oh, there's this mm-hmm. church management thing. Oh yeah. I, I get an email from this thing. What is that? Am I supposed to log into that? You know? So. Yeah. 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 Uh, it's but it can a, be it, a real good tool for, for your lay leaders and volunteers to, to be part of things. And I can imagine though, I mean, the, the, the process that you just described, which is phenomenal. And I, it sounds like the kind of thing that even yearly could benefit a church to sit down and make sure that we are all still, you know, are, are we driving the boat in the same direction or are some people paddling right. this way and some people paddling this way and two people are actually duplicating the same work. It it helps not only unify a team, but it makes that decision actually very easy by the time you get to it. If you can define yeah. that, those goals and the, and the direction you're trying to head, um, you flipped the conversation from who has the newest, coolest, shiniest features to what's going to actually help us get to our goal. Um, yeah. Yeah. Really incredibly unifying. Well, I yeah, think... what I know. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Yeah. Oh, well, what I noticed, I think there's such like a r- relational level to it. Like what you said is that um, you're not going to have the automated email, like send to, you know, Andy or Stephanie about it. It's going to like the software is going to help you build those relationships. So the focus isn't necessarily on, you know, like what you and Stephanie said, the new shiny thing. It's more of tools to help build the community, deepen the relationships and make the community flourish. Because I think um, what you said, I, um, Elliot, was, you know, people expect the software to solve the problems, but at the root is really the people problems and helping use technology shine a light on that is so like, I think people don't th- realize it and to have you help them and keep going back to the mission. And what Stephanie said before is that a lot of like, entrepreneurs of businesses businesses or organizations have to kind of fall in love with the problem first before they can mm-hmm. figure out um, the steps after and I th- that's like the huge difference I see between like consulting and sales is like you are helping deepen the relationships yeah yeah I think the thing I was it was just kind of coming to mind is uh, probably that as I do this more and more and I've done about 40 of these projects um mm-hmm. the the thing i see the most is that uh you know the the tools are are important but the process of a staff mm. uh defining the ministry process is is the critical thing and and then the the relational aspect of that staff working together um you know i was working with a, a church not too long ago that, that the clear issue was that 
there there wasn't a lot of buy-in amongst the staff of we're going to use the software together whether we mm -hmm. like it or not and i gave gave this analogy i th there's a joke around our office that i have an analogy for everything but um <laughs> we're ready let's say we're going on a mission trip to disney world because who doesn't like disney world and True. um so we're we're leaving disney world from i don't know where let's say from nashville because that's where i am um it's about a 12 hour drive and we're probably going to take, let's say we're taking 40 people and we're going to take a bus, you know, we're going to take, uh, the, uh, the, the rental bus, uh, with the bathroom in the back, um, you know, and 40 seats and a movie, you know, yes. thing that you can play and all that. Um, and so there's a lot of benefit to being on the bus, right? I mean, we, we can, we got all 40 people on the bus for 12 hours. So we can do some team building exercises. We can really talk about what our mission in Disney world is. How are we going to share our faith with people next to us in line for uh, the st new star Wars ride? We're going to be in it for like five hours. So we got lots of time. Um, but you know, what are we going to do when we get there? We got a lot of benefit to, you know, we've got a bathroom on bus, so we can just keep going. We don't have to stop every 20 minutes. Um, we're all together. So we're going to end up there at the same time. We're going to pull into the hotel at, you know, whatever time we get there. Uh, there's some downsides to the bus too. Like it's great to have the bathroom on the bus. It's terrible to have the bathroom on the bus. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we're going to pull into the Shoney's together, but what if I don't like Shoney's, you know? Uh, Nobody likes Shoney's. I want to stretch my legs out, but the seats on this bus aren't really stretchable. Mm -hmm. um, you know, wow, you know, we're going to be driving down to Orlando. And we're going we're gonna to pass through uh, some town where my family is. I would love to stop and say hi to them on the way through. Um, okay, well... Those are all some trade-offs of being on the bus together. Now, alternative, we could all say, "Okay, I'm going to go. I'm going to go out here, and um, I'm just going to I'm going to drive my car. I'm just going to drive on my own. And man, I get to pull over at whatever restaurant I want. I can drive the speed I want. I can pull over to the bathroom whenever I need to. Uh, we got plenty of room to stretch out our feet in the back of this van. Uh, whatever, right?" Uh, I'm going to stop and see family. But, you know, if we take if, if a few people take the van, we're not going to show up at the same time. We're not going to have the opportunity to share in this mission together uh, and and drive to the same set of values and um, the, the same set of mission tasks that we're, we're doing on the bus. Uh, mm -hmm. So if some people step out, they're going to miss out on the important things that happen on the bus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, we could say as a strategy uh, you know what? Our strategy is we're going to caravan. We're going to take eight eight cars down there, and everybody's just going to pair up and go do it. And that mm -hmm. has some, some other benefit as well. Um, but if we say we're taking the bus and some people step out of that, we lose that benefit. Um, yeah. And so – you know, in this in this engagement with this client, you know, we had one or two departments that had just said, hey, I don't like this feature of the software. I'm going to go use a different thing. Mm -hmm. And their biggest problem was, well, now we've got this other thing. In this case, it was using registrations for other things. Mm -hmm. We don't have the information coming from people that registered for our VBS or for right. our uh, camp or for our classes coming back into the church management software. Right. And to get it, we have to retype it and re-enter it. And, and that's a pain and time consuming. And, you know, at the end of the day, the root problem for them, regardless of what choice they make of what tool to use, is are we going to do it together? Mm. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the end of the day, they actually uh, at this point have chosen to stay on their current software, mm. do some re-implementation, do some re redesign of their process and decide mm. which things they're willing to give up on. Now mm -hmm. I'm going to make a caveat with my little example. You've got somebody in the trip that needs, needs a wheelchair and they need the wheelchair van. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a solid case for that van needs to go separate because mm -hmm. this bus can't do the wheelchair thing. Right. So in the same way, we've got some church management software things where, you know, at the end of the day, this software doesn't do what we need it to do. And we have an exception that we need to decide. Yeah, that's an exception we're going to make. We understand yeah. the trade-offs. How are we going to meet that trade-off then? Right. Yeah. So, uh, so there certainly are going to be cases that you, you make those decisions. Yeah. I, that's a, Fantastic analogy, like because I I think it's often 
that trade-off piece because tech, we, we're the product team behind a software and I can tell you yeah. wholeheartedly, we wish we could make, we have a ma magic wand over every piece of software and just make it automatically do everything. But there's reasons why softwares have limitations. It's a tool just like everything else. Mm -hmm. It's probably always evolving and, and different pieces of technology are evolving at different rates. So the question is not, where is the piece of software that is my magic bullet to solve everything? It's more what you said is, which, what are our priorities? Which are the trade-offs mm -hmm. we're willing to make? And when do we need to decide to ride in two separate cars versus actually right. it's better for us to ride in the same car, even if we don't like this small feature or this other thing. Yeah. So Elliot, I'm curious, the world has changed, obviously, in the last few years. Churches are online now. This is yeah. a new, this is a new puzzle piece in the grand puzzle you solve with churches, which is not only what are we doing pr process wise in person and how does technology support that, but how do we now facilitate this group of people online? We generally yeah. work with three different types of audiences with churches and the overlap probably with Enable and with what, what Alter does is the two audiences I would describe as one is that hybrid audience. Mm -hmm. So those that have, you know, online is really a, a front door to what happens in person. It's a stepping stone. Right. The second, the second group are those that are actually treating online like its own campus. It's resource staffed and thought of missionally as its own group of co own community. So you have those, you know, two audiences. What have you been seeing churches wrestle with and understand about how to approach online in that in that grand you know analogy that you used? Yeah, so I do see a lot of churches, like you say, treating their online uh, membership as a as a congregation of its of its own. Mm -hmm. And certainly there's a lot of back and forth. But, you know, if um, and I know you guys are seeing a lot of, you know, here's a church in Tampa, but, you know, suddenly they have a, um, you know, a, a, a participation around the world. And so mm -hmm. how do we care for? Uh, these people that are all over the place that, you know, there's no way they can be here in person. They live in Des Moines. Hmm. So, you know, um, and the opportunity that comes to that too with, uh, well, you know, there's there's these Alaskan villages that don't have a church because there's 28 people in a village, right. but they can jump in to a right. community anywhere in the world. So one of the things I see a lot happening around in church management right now is how how can we make that interaction more mobile uh so it can happen anywhere um mm -hmm. so there's a lot going on right now both in the church management products themselves as well as kind of the ecosystem of things that integrate um of say text uh, text integrations. So text mm -hmm. I'm new to a short code and uh as soon as that you know, that text interaction starts, the, there's automation that can start the, great. And if it doesn't see your phone number, say, we're so glad to meet you, what's your name? And mm -hmm. then go through a little chat bot to actually get your information into the system. And at some point, mm -hmm. once it has enough, it could kick over a message, a, a, a real text message to uh, the, um, the discipleship pastor to say, mm -hmm. hey, we, we just got this this new I'm new message from from Maeve and she's interested in church. And then the conversation becomes real time between Maeve and that pastor and is tracked in the software. So it's safe. Right. It's mm -hmm. tracked. We can come back and look at it. And when mm -hmm. the other pastor is looking at how did how did how did we get mm -hmm. you know connected, they can see some history there. Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, you can imagine now a scenario where in the middle of your online service, you say, hey, if you're joining from away, just just text us. I'm here or I'm right. online or something like that and, and kickstart that conversation. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, other ways that we could do that, you know, your, your chat hosts in uh, in your online platform. Uh, I know you guys have the ability for for hospitality people to be in a chat alongside the service and could be introducing themselves to people and catching that information and then inputting it into the system so that we can follow yeah. up and uh, stay in touch. Um, you know, at, at some point, maybe there's an integration there where that can be somewhat automated. But those are exciting things because you can take that process that would be happening in person, whether it's I fill out a piece of paper card and drop it in the offering plate or I text I'm here 
uh, while I'm in the service or I catch a QR code and go to a form, uh, any of those things can all funnel right into the same process in church management. And then right. based on the criteria of that person's contact, they came in via the I'm online or they mm -hmm. came in via I'm here and they said I'm at the, you know, the Springfield campus mm -hmm. um, or they, you know, shot a QR code that had a form that was related to the Springfield campus. Right. Uh, any of those things can now then say, OK, great. Well, uh, because that came in through this path, send it to a workflow that attaches to the Springfield campus mm -hmm. hospitality coordinator. Right. And right. then follow up and invite them to come back next week. Mm -hmm. You know, we're stepping back as well, though, like here's a I'm new button on your website that lets you plan your right. visit and, you know, get right. kind of goes ahead and gets the process started. So those are cool things that are happening that start to tie yeah. that together. Uh, and then you can just kind of imagine on down the road if you if you write mm -hmm. your process and figure out what you want to do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of software has triggers that you can do to say, hey, you know, if I see that you came in and you're part of our online campus, but I see that you've attended five times in six weeks right. at our Springfield campus, fire a notification to that Springfield campus person mm -hmm. that says, hey, we've got somebody that's started coming online and is now here. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. And do the same thing to the online uh, pastor to say, hey, we've noticed that Elliot mm -hmm. was part of your congregation, but his migrated some of his engagement over to the Springfield right. campus. And so you've got this kind of then ability for the, the, the online pastor and the Springfield pastor to sort of hand off and make sure that that person stays cared for during the process. Right. It's a, what you just described is something we often talk about in, in altar as well, which is it's really hard to build a relationship with the person on the other side of the screen if you don't know who they are. Yeah. That's, you know, it, it's true of in person. That's why we we do guest follow up when we we try we we invest in technology to help us better understand who is this person, where did they come from? Because not to automate ourselves out of the relationship, but to actually allow us to be more personable and and cater to that person more individually. Same thing online and, and that's I think one of the big things that is gonna be happening in the online space is that getting to know of the person on the other side of the screen and you know alter sits in one piece of that we are we do nothing with the in-person but we are that whether it's your virtual front door or an online living room you could describe it as whichever way you're using it it's helping move people and down that funnel automation funnel on the staff side of knowing who are these people where did they come from and actually being able to know that they're either online or they're in person or they're fluctuating back and forth between the two Right. Yeah. One of the things I love that a couple of churches that I've been working with recently are doing is they're building a shepherding model that says, hey, here's mm -hmm. here's our elders or here's a team of disciplers that we're going to we're going to actually assign them to a group of people, mm -hmm. um, you know, say 10 families or 15 families, whatever makes sense. We just want them to stay in touch. We want them to reach out once a, mm -hmm. you know, once a quarter. Maybe they've some of them are dividing up by what they might call parishes like a like a. Um, geographic area so it's you know it's people that are geographically related to each other right. and you know so that gives you the option to then just track those contacts and make sure that hey i'm checking in how how are you connected how can we help you be connected where mm -hmm. where where are you growing or stalling and feel like you want some help and right. and then that that shepherd person can can log that contact right. um and the system can make sure that those contacts are happening Right. And so particularly as we get, as we're coming out of this, you know, what, what is in-person group look like? What does it yeah. not look like? People are really inconsistent right now with that, but, uh, yeah. but making real human contact and mm -hmm. making that the, the thing that we're making sure happens, um, then lets us know like, Hey, who are our people? But that, that's, shepherd can know 10 families right, right. it's really hard for a pastor of a you know any size church to yeah, know yeah. a few Everyone. hundred or mm -hmm. ten thousand families right but mm -hmm. but i can know 15 families right at yeah. some level right it's so it it's the phrase we use all the time which is you know how do you how can you more effectively and, and faster move people from anonymous to known 
and mm. from being known by someone to connected at least one person. It doesn't have to be every single person, but but to grow that that relational network so that they're not just a fly on the wall. They they ha they've made a personal connection with someone. Um, yeah. And and I I do think it's the inconsistent attendance now that's happening in person and the fluctuating between online and in person is where technology does have an important role to play in, in not automating the relationship again, but in that yeah. just visibility, giving visibility to where people are when you can't actually see them. Right. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, um, you know, one of the last questions I have for you, um, Elliot is with churches that are moving into that online campus model. So let's say I'm a church that, has decided I'm going to resource my online viewers. I'm going to put a pastor in charge and maybe some discipleship folks and really think about that. Ooh, did I freeze? Nope, you're I good. A little bit. You're back. Um, how 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 are you seeing those? You just described a creative way that people are finding regional ways to connect families together. Are you seeing any creative ways that people are creating engagement pathways for online only church? I have not yet seen a lot there. I think it's really new, um, mm -hmm. you know, for churches to be defining that that online pastor. But I, I, I guess I would say I see in the past, say, six to nine months, a lot of the churches I'm working with have, have named somebody and put them in that seat. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say they're still in that kind of storming uh for, you know, phase of trying to figure out, well, okay, now I've, I've got the job and I've got the responsibility. How, how exactly are we going to, uh, to do it? So I think that's in a lot of flux for a lot of churches. I love what Jeff Reed and his team, mm -hmm. uh, have been doing there and he just took a new job somewhere. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I can't remember, uh, exactly how that's changed, but, you know, he's been leading that that whole conversation since way before the pandemic mm -hmm. um, yeah. of, you know, before we all had to had to do it. Right. So. Right. Right. Um, so I probably would be more curious as to what y'all are seeing as people have yeah. come on and have have gone from Altered Lives solved the pandemic problem to, OK, mm -hmm. this is a real part of our actual, you know, go forward ministry strategy. Yeah. Um, you know, certainly, certainly I do see a lot of churches segmenting their, their church management to call it a, a campus. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. you know, so they are, they are looking at those, those people as members of a campus and, yeah. uh, shepherd, the, shepherding them, you know, as, as if they were just one of their physical campuses. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. I, what I think from our perspective, we see, um, a lot of folks using Alter Live relaunching their online church, right? And because of that, the the you know online during the last two years has often been it was a band aid solution for all intents and purposes. You know, we didn't have a lot of time to plan for it, and it was trying to meet the needs of a wide range of audience, not just those who self selected into it. But now we people are starting to self select into where they want to be connected whether in person fluctuating between the two or online only. And so it's, it's almost easier now to think about online only folks and say, who are these people? What are their unique needs? How can we help serve them? What does it mean to disciple them in the ways that, you know, where can we meet them where they are versus trying to, the phrase I like to use is boil the ocean. You know, we're not right. trying to do everything for everyone with every single tool. So that relaunch is is where we we have a lot of churches that have been using altar relaunching on altar or churches that used it for a while stopped and now are coming back to it because they're ready to revisit that strategy and they've actually done the work of the process or they'd like to you know walk through that with us as well so um i i think there's a there's a change in the change in the air yeah, it just seems like every week it's a change. In the um, but, I, you know, I feel like I know a lot of people that just, you know, you've got the pandemic, you've you've got a lot of just other church issues floating around that have landed people going, OK, I mean, a lot of people left wherever they were, because I think 
it wasn't working for them as a church, mm-hmm. but they couldn't just stop showing up because their connections right. were there. And then the pandemic came and it, it sort of gave them this opportunity to go, wait a minute, this isn't really my community, but they're still trying to figure out where their community is. Yes. And so I think, you know, now we're, we're probably to me less seeing people that are not returning where they came from because mm-hmm. of the pandemic, but because they, they are reassessing their entire world yeah. and who are my people? Where do I live? You know, we're, you're seeing it in the the so-called great resignation. Well, oh wait a minute, why why do I live and work in Nashville? Yeah, there's nothing tying people down. So so the question from a discipleship perspective mm-hmm. becomes: We believe that God's kingdom is God's kingdom from you know from from forever past to forever forward, and how how do we as believers continue to engage and disciple people? in whatever context God is Mm -hmm. calling them. Right. So, Mm -hmm. so how does online do that? Well, you know, that, that leaves some churches with a call that say, you know what, our call is not to this zip code. Our call is to all these people who are feeling lonely and disconnected in this way. And Mm -hmm. we happen to be the DNA that they match with. And it doesn't matter if they're in Moscow or, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, or Paris or New York city or Tampa. Yeah. So I think you're absolutely right. It's that it, you you nailed it in that it's people are reevaluating is this the community I belong to? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I think that's an important question for churches as they're relaunching or considering their online folks is is who what is the actual intention of this online campus or structure that you're using? What, where does it fit into the disciple and who who are you uniquely called to reach? Who are you yeah. uniquely and who do you, you want to hang out with on the internet? There's a lot of yeah. people on the internet. So, you know, is it is it that you're going to be hyper local and you're, you know, it's just a front door to those in your local area? Is it that you want to, you know, it, I, I just talked to a church out in um, Indiana that wants to launch an online campus because there's so many little farm towns that are, you mm-hmm. know, an hour, two hours that don't have a church nearby. And so they're, they're local, but they're going to be digital, you know? And then yeah. others that are totally international and they're specifically working with people with disabilities or um, those that, uh, yeah, feel baggage from the church. It's, it's again, goes back to, I think, a very start of our conversation, which is also a great way to wrap this up is, you know, your process, know, know your goal. What, why, why do you need to use the technology you're choosing to use? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So hopefully yeah. that's helpful to folks. Uh, that, that's kind of how we typically approach it. It's it's super helpful, and I know mm-hmm. Maeve and I have just kind of been sitting here absorbing, and uh, <laughs> I've been I've been actually taking notes on my other screen um, because there's a there's an interesting thing that you were saying in terms of the online campus and the idea that the philosophy is that it used to be kind of a, a band aid, like Stephanie said, mm-hmm. and now you know we're watching it at the church I work for where people are, are realizing and understanding the value of it. Um, but we're trying to, we're trying to implement some top down methods and some top down technologies that are out of my control as the digital pastor. Let me just put that out there, uh, that may or may not work. And we need to start asking some deeper questions. And those questions need to start with discipleship. Steffi and I were mm-hmm. at a, uh, a conference back in March. Is that when it was exponential? Mm-hmm. And the biggest thing we kept hearing was we need discipleship, we need discipleship, we need discipleship. And yet in the online space, those questions aren't necessarily, they're, 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 it's a felt need, but they're not necessarily being asked because we're always chasing the shiny thing. And so it's, it's refreshing to hear from somebody like you, Elliot, that is, that is trying to push for, mm-hmm. hey, the process involves <laughs> womb to tomb type stuff. The process involves yeah. making people more like Jesus each and every day. So mm-hmm. thanks, thanks for doing that. We, we appreciate that. Yeah. Absolutely. Cool. Uh, well, if we have maybe any questions, I know, uh, like I said, you and I have been just kind of bystanders on the wall here, just enjoying <laughs> enjoying the interview. Well, I just want to say I, I really appreciate your analogies and 
<laughs> and I think they have more. I, we can keep going. Yeah. <laughs> I'd be well, curious. You talked about the house one, the house analogy. Yeah. That was a good one. But I like the card of Disney World. Uh, that was. It down. That was. Yeah. I live in Tampa, so like Orlando yeah. is an hour and a half that way. I, I was. I was on board with that, except for the Shoney's. <laughs> like Shoney's is a. Uh, no go. It's a Waffle House down even, here. Oh, okay. Sort of dating right. myself with Shoney's. Yeah, wow. yeah. I mean, you could have said Big Boy. I don't know if you guys have Big Boy where you're at, but Big Boy, Waffle House is, I think, the industry standard around here. It is. That's right. <laughs> cool. Well, Elliot, Stephanie, Maeve, yeah. thank you guys so much for being on the show. We thank appreciate. You. We appreciate everybody else. Uh, you can find more about Elliot in the comments. Uh, everything about Enable Ministries in the comments or the chat below. If you have anything that you want to reach out uh, and chat about, we're always available in the comments in the chat and for Elliot as well. His contact information and all their socials are there. Feel free to reach out. We will talk to you guys next time. We love you all. See you soon.